Okay, so we talked about the expected value of a function of a random variable, right? Things like this. And we said, okay, if I want to compute this number, this is just the integral of the function against the PDF of whatever x is, right? Now, this is fine, but one way to think about this is that we've defined a new random variable y, and I'm just computing the expected value of y, which is this, right? But just knowing the expected value is not enough to characterize the entire random variable, right? Suppose I want to know what is the PDF of this new random variable y, or the CDF. How would I do that? Well, I'm going to take you through that process. So let's suppose that I have um, this example where x is a uniform random variable on the interval 0, 1, and I define a new random variable y is e to the x. So what are the PDF and CDF of y? So the formula or the process I'm going to take you through it never fails if you really think about it carefully. So the first thing I always like to do is to compute the CDF and then take the derivative of that to get the PDF. Okay, So the CDF of y is this new random variable capital, or it's capital Y, right? So this is equal to the probability that capital Y is less than some number. And now I work out what do I know about Y? Well, Y was defined as e to the x. And now I'm going to take the log of both sides, where ln is the natural log. And now this is an expression in the form of something I know about x. This is the CDF of x evaluated at this point log y. Okay. And so what is a CDF? Remember I said x was uniform on 0, 1, right? So the CDF of x basically looks like this, right? So it's going to be equal to um, log y if um, log y is in 0, 1, because it's, this is basically equal to x if x is in 0, 1, and it's going to be equal to 0 if log y is less than 0, and 1 if log y is greater than 1. Now this is a little bit awkward, right? So we can kind of rearrange this a little bit to say, okay, you know, what does this mean? Log y in 0, 1 means that y is in e to the 0, e to the 1, or 1 comma e, right? And so if I work out the, the whole answer, what I have is that the CDF of y is equal to 0 if y is less than 1. It's equal to log y if y is between 1 and e. And it's equal to 1 if y is greater than e. Okay? And so if I were to kind of plot that, what would it look like? Here's 1, here's e, I'm 0 up to here, I'm 1 after e, and log y kind of gently slopes up like this. And then to compute the PDF, I would take the derivative, right? The derivative is equal to, well, it's going to be flat um, when outside of this interval. Inside the interval, it's going to be equal to the derivative of the CDF, 1 over y. Right? And so that basically looks like if this is my CDF, what does my PDF look like? Uh, I guess this is Y. And this is Y, sorry. So again, between 1 and E, I have flat PDF. And then Let's see, at 1, I have 1. At e, I have 1 over e, which is smaller than 1. So it kind of looks like this. And so this is my answer, right? Um, and so let me just kind of be more general about the process that I took. So I said y was a function of uh, x. And let's assume that g is invertible or one to one, meaning that for every um, value of x, there's only one element of y. I'm going to show you how to deal with the harder case in the next video. But if this is true, then the CDF of y is like saying the probability that y is less than some number, which is like the probability that g of x is less than that number. 
And then I'm going to take the inverse, which is possible since g is 1 to 1. And then I'm going to say this was the CDF of x at this point. And then if I want to get the PDF, I would take the derivative, which is just ddy of the CDF, which is, well, now I have to kind of take the derivative of this thing. Well, I have to use the chain rule, right? The derivative of the CDF is the PDF. And then I have to take the derivative of the inside also with respect to y. That's the chain rule part. Okay. So this is kind of the general functional way of solving these kinds of problems. Okay. So let me do this with a particularly easy transformation, which is a linear transformation. Okay. So a linear transformation of a random variable. That just means that y is equal to ax plus b. How does this transformation change the PDF and the CDF of the random variable? Well, if I follow my um, method from above, that's like saying the CDF of y. Again, this is really tedious, but I'm just doing it in a super straightforward way. Now I have to rearrange this to get something that is in the form of x. And then I'm going to subtract b and divide by a. Now this is only true if uh, a is greater than 0, right? Because um, if a is less than 0, then I would flip the inequality, right? When I divide by the negative number. And of course, a can't be equal to 0, otherwise I get a constant, right? So the answer is this is the CDF at this point if a is greater than 0, and it's 1 minus the CDF at this point if a is less than 0. Okay. And then what is the PDF? The PDF is the derivative of the CDF, right? So the PDF is it's the derivative. Let's again break it out into these cases. So it's going to be the PDF times the derivative if a is less than zero or greater than zero. And it's going to be again the same PDF times uh, 1 over a if a is less than zero. So actually, I could just think about this as saying, make it a little bit easier. I can get rid of this curly brackets and just say it's 1 over the absolute value of a times the. PDF. That takes care of both cases. And so mentally, what's kind of happening here, right? So for example, suppose I have a random variable and I um, shift it, right? So let's suppose I have y and I just shift it by a scalar. I mean, it's kind of easy to see what's going to happen to the um, PDF, right? So if this is the old PDF, all that I'm saying is that um, what used to be 0, right, is now going to shift over to be um, minus b, right? So it's going to kind of look like this. So all I'm doing is, I mean, you have to let me make it clear. I, I drew this kind of badly. These are the same shape. All I'm doing is I'm just shifting the PDF over so things start in a different place, okay? And in the same way, if I have a, um, you know, say I have y equals 2x, what happens to the PDF? If this is my old PDF, then my new PDF is going to spread out by a factor of 2 and also be shorter by a factor of 2, right? So if this value was, you know, b, the new height is going to be b over 2, and if this value is a, this number is going to be 2a, right? So it's kind of like I still have the same unit of probability mass, it's just spread out twice as much, okay? And in particular, that's what happens with the Gaussian. So let's suppose that x is Gaussian with um, mean mu and variance sigma squared. And now I form a new random variable 
y equals ax plus b. What happens there? Well, here's my old PDF, which we had from a couple of lectures ago. My new PDF, if I apply the formula, is basically saying, okay, I'm going to take uh, 1 over the absolute value of a times the PDF evaluated at y minus b over a. Now this is going to be a little bit tedious, so let me start plugging stuff in. I'm going to get basically 1 over um, square root of 2 pi sigma absolute value of a e to the minus, yuck, 1 over 2 sigma squared, and then I'm going to have y minus uh, b over a minus mu all squared. Right? So all I'm doing is I'm substituting this in for that. Right? Now I have to expand all this junk around. I'm going to leave this up towards the top so we remember what I had. So this is again going to be equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma absolute value of a e to the minus 1 over. Now I'm going to start to take uh, some stuff out. I'm going to take the a here out and then what I have over here is um, y minus a mu plus b squared. So what do I see here? Actually I see that this is Gaussian with a new mean that is just a mu plus b and a new sigma which is just sigma times the absolute value of a, right? And so this actually shows me that linearly transforming a Gaussian produces another Gaussian. And in fact, I guess I was kind of implicitly using this when we were doing those Gaussian experiments from a few lectures ago when I was taking a regular random variable and turning it into a normal random variable, the one with mean zero and standard deviation one. So this is kind of like why it works. So next, picture, next video, I'm going to talk about what happens when there isn't this one-to-one -one correspondence between x and y. We'll do that next time.